So I'm going to give you an in-detail view of why Silicon Valley Bank failed and you'll understand that it was that this was an incredible failure of the risk management at Silicon Valley Bank. So I'm first going to go over the theory that we need and then I'm going to go over the timeline of events and what actually led to the failure of the bank. But let's look first at the balance sheet of Silicon Valley Bank. So as every bank, Silicon Valley Bank has equity. It's about 12.5% of their balance sheet. And Silicon Valley Bank has deposits. So that's, in theory, you and me who can give money to the bank as in a bank account. But Silicon Valley Bank is specialized on Silicon Valley startups. So here you can actually see how their deposits are made up. And you see that most of their deposits are technology startups. So most of those deposits actually come from technology or Silicon Valley startups. That's their kind of business model. So most of the deposits are not private people, but startups with a lot of money. And on the asset side, Silicon Valley had a lot of government bonds. And so something interesting happened from 2018 to 2021. The startups go really well. So what happens is that the startups can raise a lot of money and put a lot more deposits into the bank. So what happens is that the deposits grow rapidly in the time period from 2018 to 2021. And what does the bank do? Well, the bank has gets money and they have to pay low interest rates here. So maybe 0.5% and they want to earn money with this. So what they do is they buy more bonds and they buy long-term government bonds or mortgage bonds. And those bonds are 10 year to 30 year bonds. So you get your money back after 10 to 30 years and they pay slightly higher interest rates. I think they got about 1.8% interest rates on those bonds. And so you see that in theory, Silicon Valley Bank makes money, right? 1.3% is the difference between what they pay on the liability side and what they get on the asset side. But there is a catch here. There is a maturity mismatch because the depositors, well, they can get their money at any time. And the money that is in bonds, that is bound in the bonds. So the bonds have 10 to 30 year maturity. So this money is not very liquid. So far, so good, because this is the normal business model of a bank. So let's go a bit into bonds because I need to explain to you one important concept. So this is, for example, a one year bond. You buy this financial product and you get 105 euros a year. So the question is, what do you have to pay for this bond today? And the standard formula for valuing such a bond is to say, okay, I, I take what I get in a year and I divide this by one plus the interest rate on the market. So let's say the interest rate is 5%. What's the value of a bond? In this case, it's 100 euros. Let's just say the interest rate is not 5%, but 10%. What's the value of our bond then? Well, the value of our bond is roughly 95 euros. So what does that mean? Well, with rising interest rates, bond prices fall. Okay, so let's get into the risk factors that were relevant for Silicon Valley Bank. And for them, there were especially two risk factors. One is interest rate risk in the banking book. And the second one is liquidity risk. Let's start with interest rate risks in the banking book. So to understand what this means, we need to look closer at those bonds in the portfolio of Silicon Valley Bank. And for, for every bank, there are two types of assets. There are assets in the trading book and assets in the banking book. Assets in the trading book, they are held short term and the bank wants to trade with them. In other words, buys them and wants to sell them in the near future. They are valued to market. So in the balance sheet, they appear on market value. And the bonds in the banking book, the bank buys them and wants to hold them to maturity. In other words, if we have this one year bond, the bank buys it at its price at the start of the year and then waits until the bond pays its final payment of 105 euros. If that is the case, so if the bank wants to hold the bond until maturity, then it's in the banking book. And bonds in the banking book are not valued at market value, but at purchase value. 
So in other words, if, if Silicon Valley Bank would plan to sell the bond in the middle of the year, it would be in the trading book and it would appear with market value on the balance sheet. If, however, Silicon Valley Bank plans to hold the bond, then it is in the banking book and it will appear with purchase value. And even with bonds in the banking book, there is risk. And this risk is called interest rate risk in the banking book. And this risk is typically measured in two ways, in the present value way and in the net interest income way. I have made a detailed video on interest rate risk in the banking book, and here's only a short overview. So what is the present value view? Well, the present value view looks at all the payments that are coming from the bonds over time. So this may be year one, year two, year three, and year four. And it asks, okay, what are those bonds worth today? Why is this an important question? Well, even if I do not plan on selling my bonds, sometimes it can be, sometimes I may be forced to do it. Maybe the owners of the bank want to shut shut down the bank right now, then they have to sell all the assets, even the ones in the banking book. And that can be unforeseen. So it's important to understand what is my portfolio worth today. And that is what the present value approach looks at. The second approach or the second approach in interest rate risk in the banking book is so-called net interest income approach. And in the net interest income approach, I also look at the time axis, but I look at the following. I look at how much interest I have to pay for my liabilities. So that's the interest I have to pay. And I look at how much interest I get from my bonds. And maybe if the interest that I get from my bonds is plus 100, but I have to pay minus 50 on the liability side in year one, then I'm fine. And I do this for every year in the future. So I always look at what, what comes in, what goes out, and do they match? And it might be that I identify a mismatch so that I only get 50 euros from my bonds, but that, that I have to pay 100 on my interest. And if I have identified such a problem, well, I need to take measures. For instance, hold more cash or do other things. Okay, so this is the net interest income view. And the second risk that is important for um, Silicon Valley Bank is the liquidity risk. Um, the example I always like to give to give is, well, let's just think about the CEO sits in his office and he has to pay the janitor and there's a Picasso on the wall, but he has forgotten his wallet. Then he can't pay the janitor, although he technically has the money, so he's illiquid. And that's classical liquidity risk. In banking, that is typically the case when a bank gets money from people, so from individual depositors, and puts the money in a 30-year mortgage. Then the depositors can get their money anytime, but the money in the mortgage is bound for maybe 30 years. So that's where liquidity risk comes from in banking. So now that we have the basics down, I've talked about the balance sheet, of Silicon Valley Bank, I've talked about bonds and I've talked about interest rate risk and liquidity risk, we can actually understand what happened at Silicon Valley Bank. So I already told you that in their balance sheet, they had their equity and they had their deposits, which were rapidly growing from 2018 to 2021. And you had a lot of bonds on the asset side. And a lot of, and most of those bonds were part of the banking book and some of those bonds are part of the trading book. So now in 2021 20, to 2022, interest rates start rising. That means that our bonds in the trading book start to lose in value. So some of the value here gets lost. However, Silicon Valley Bank does not have as much bonds in the trading book, so that's not really a problem. On the balance sheet, you do not really see a loss in value for bonds in the banking book because they are not revalued. But you see a loss in present value of the bonds. So the present value of the bonds goes down. This is what you see in your interest rate risk in the banking book calculations, but you will not see this on the balance sheet because the bonds in the banking book are not marked to market value. Then what happens in the beginning of 2022, that a lot of the startups 
have trouble to get funding. Why? Because they have high interest rates and they do not want to get additional funding at those high interest rates. So in order to get money, what they do is they use their deposits. So what happens is a lot of the companies that have, that have their money at Silicon Valley Bank start to withdraw it from their accounts. So the deposits start to shrink. And now comes the big problem. As the deposits shrink very rapidly, the liquidity reserve of the bank, which is usually only a very small part of the asset side, usually it's 2% of the portfolio. So very roughly Silicon Valley Bank had a $200 billion portfolio. So you would expect that their liquidity reserve is at um, 4 billion. So what happens is, as a lot of the startups withdraw their deposits, their liquidity reserve gets, um, gets used and they have to sell bonds in the banking book. And of course, if they have to sell those bonds in the banking book, they have to sell them to the market. But of course, when you sell those bonds, you have to sell them at market price. So what happens is they lose money on those bonds because they have those bonds at purchase price in the balance sheet, but they have to sell at market price. And with rising interest rates, those bonds are worth a lot less. So what happens is they sell those bonds, they make a loss, and this loss basically wipes out all their equity. So that's bad. The bank, bank doesn't have equity because it has made a lot of losses on selling those bonds. So what does the bank do? Well, the bank says, oh, we need new equity. So we need investors to get equity. And what happens then is people start to realize that. And what happens on 8th of March is that 42 billion, billion euros are withdrawn from the bank. And as I've told you, the liquidity reserve of a bank is usually 2% of the balance sheet. So in the case of Silicon Valley Bank, 4 billion, there's no way that Silicon Valley Bank can unravel their assets that fast. And with this bank run, the bank goes bust. So to summarize why this happened is basically because Silicon Valley Bank didn't understand their interest rate risk in the banking book. And because of the unfolding interest rate risk, because of the higher interest rates, a bank run came and they could not manage liquidity. So in other words, their failure in the end was a failure of liquidity, but it was caused by rising interest rates and a failure to accurately assess interest rate risks. They did not pay enough attention to the loss and present value of their portfolio. And this is what basically brought them to fall down because they had to sell a lot of those assets at a lower present value. They had a lot of junk risk in those bonds and they did not hedge that risk accurately. In my opinion, the sad thing here is that President Donald Trump actually had lifted banking regulations. While banks have to do interest rate risk in the banking book until 2018, in 2018, Donald Trump said, well, we only require this for banks with an asset, with a balance sheet larger than 250 billion euros. The balance sheet of Silicon Valley Bank is at about 212 billion euros. So they did not have to do those calculations. Also, they did not have a chief risk officer during that time because their chief risk officer left and they took about six to eight months to hire a new one. So what Silicon Valley Bank actually did is they failed to manage one of the most basic risks in banking. And I think this is a very, very sad picture of the state of the financial system that something like this can happen.